Okay, today I'm going to talk a little bit about laboratory design, as Dion said. Um, specifically, in in the case of mine site labs, um, this is what this is aimed at. Um, the same sort of principles apply to any laboratory that's being built, but um, specifically uh, mine site labs is the most important part. Firstly, as you, you've already had me introduce, so you'd understand. Uh, it's just a repetition of what came on before. Um, I've spent my whole life in the laboratory industry. Um, started out in soil science, UWA, Pilbara Labs in New Guinea, uh, Pilbara Labs in Perth, obviously, um, and then went to ALS Metallurgy for 27 years. Um, the lab started out at ALS Metallurgy as, um, or Amtec, as a very small lab, grew to about 80 odd people, I think it's now around about 35, somewhere around about that. Um, very complex laboratory, lots of um, instruments, different sorts, XRF, ICP, ICPMS and so on and so forth. Um, it's uh, probably uh, a little bit smaller than it used to be, as I said, um, but it's uh, very, a very full laboratory in terms of procedures uh, that are used. Okay, so let's say you're starting a lab project on a mine site. Um, probably not relevant to a lot of you here, but anyway, if you're starting one on, the, on a mine site, uh, usually it's because you're transitioning from an explorer to miner. And uh, how do you go about doing that? Uh, how do you go about getting that done? There's, uh, you can make it as simple or as complex as you want. You can employ a commercial operator uh, to come in and, and build your lab, somebody like Intertech or whoever. Uh, you can also um, organise a boot arrangement, build, own, operate and transfer. Generally these things uh, transferred at around about five years when the leases are paid off on all the instrumentation. So at the end of the five years, you get five-year-old equipment and so on. It's not necessarily ideal, but it works for a lot of mine sites. And then, of course, there's self-manage. So assuming you're uh, going to do a self-manage laboratory, how do you get organised? Well, laboratory is usually one of the last buildings to get built on a mine site. Um, for some reason, it seems to be left until almost too late. Uh, it's very common. Uh, procedure that happens on mine sites. So what you need to do is you need to find out what sort of assays are required. Um, obviously there's a target, it's gold or it's some other commodity, but you need to find out what sort of assays are required, how many um, uh, of those types of assays, what analytes they're for, um, preferred method of analysis, and then of course finally do you need lab accreditation to sell your product. If you're going to sell a concentrate, it might be advantageous to you to have some sort of lab accreditation. So what do you do? You tabulate all that, you get this. Now, too hard to see this, it's not meant for you to see, but basically it's a spreadsheet with a list of sample names, the analysis required, uh, any hazards that are present, um, be they mineral hazards or other hazards the frequency of those samples coming in on a daily basis, on a monthly basis or a yearly basis, um, and so on and so forth. So you have all of that information. You know how many samples the lab's going to receive, when they're going to come in, and uh, what analysis re is required in theory. There's a thing called scope creep which comes into this, but we'll talk about that more a bit later. So how much equipment do you need? If you have 100 samples a day requiring 24-hour turnaround, do you resource that differently from 100 samples with, say, 8 or 4-hour turnaround? Um, that can make a huge difference to resourcing the lab. So you need to calculate production rate of the equipment. So how many samples can be ring milled, how many samples can be fire assayed, how many samples can go through the XRF, and so on. Uh, if you're selling a particular product, like iron ore, for example, um, you might need to have specialised compliant equipment, 
that's accepted within the industry, like XRF. If you're going to build a lab with uh, a whole stack of titrations in it, that's not going to work for um, for the uh, for the production of the lab. You need a common sense approach to what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. So layout, this is the key component of any lab. Uh, you've got to go through all of these criteria and there's lots of them. Space around equipment, it's no good having a jaw crusher shoved in a corner and you can't get to it, but you can't get to it to service it and so on. Uh, what equipment can co coexist in the same area? Uh, how many people are going to work in the lab? Um, do you, if you have, say, three jaw crushers, you're going to have three people in that area running those jaw crushers. There's no point in having one person trying to run three jaw crushers. Um, do you need dust or vibration-free areas? Does the lab flow? You need to have the lab flowing. It's got, you can't have samples going into the lab, coming back out of the lab, going back into the lab, going out to another area. You need it to flow through the lab. I'm sure a lot of you are aware of all this. Um, and of course, what power? You need lots of power in assay laboratories. You need, um, you know, you've got crushes, you've got ICPs. A lot of equipment now, like XRFs and ICPs, runs off single phase <coughs> and lots of amps. Like XRF is 50 odd amps, ICP 50, uh, 20 to 25 amps. So you need lots of power and lots, and you need three phase power as well. Of course, you've got uh, suppliers for equipment. Different suppliers might supply something slightly different. So your layout comes into that because if you have, if you allow space for uh, three crushes, for example, that are um, have a footprint of 600 by 600, and then you go and order three crushes that have a footprint of a meter by a meter, it's not going to work in your layout. So you need to know what you're buying and where it's going to go and check the alternative suppliers for uh, uh, the size of their equipment. Um, dust collectors, obviously, you need dust collectors in most mine site labs. Um, you need to determine the size. That's based on what your workstations are, what other equipment you've got there, what sort of airflow is required through those equipment and so on. Okay, compressor. We're still on layout. This will go on for a bit. Um, compressor is a classic example. You go to a mine site, invariably there's a, a compressor on the plant. They just plumb air into the lab and say, there you go, there's your air. Um, doesn't work because if you pump oily, damp air into a bag house, for example, you ruin the filters in a matter of weeks. So you'd be replacing those filters. Um, very common problem. You can get around that, of course, by putting in filtration and and dryers and stuff like that. Uh, what sort of water is required? If you're doing aquaregions, you can probably get by with tap water. If you're doing anything a little bit more technical, you might need RO water, type 3, or you may need ultra pure water, type 1. So it depends on what you um, what you actually need. And of course, it depends how much you need. If you, if you need uh, a, a very large amount of type 1 water, that's a different plant from a very small amount of type 1 water. Uh, in the case of waste products, what's going to happen with your waste products? If you have fire assay waste, it can't go to landfill anymore. Uh, you've got to have that treated, use that inverted commas, in Perth. I think they're still sending it off as far as I know. If there's asbestos in your, this is uh, quite common in WA. If there's asbestos in your, you have to treat, deal with that. If you have sample prep and you're pulling air out of sample prep, You've got negative pressure in sample prep, good thing for asbestos. If you then put in an air conditioner and start blowing lots of air into sample prep, you're going to blow all that asbestos back out of the room. So you have to consider all of these things. Um, safety shower, eye wash stations, they're annoying because they've got to go somewhere in the lab and they're invariably in an inconvenient spot. Okay, so you still got to deal with mineral hazard risks. We talked about asbestos. There may be lead involved or other base metals, uh, radioactivity, um, all of these sorts of things. You've got to allow for those in the layout. Uh, often forgotten is the IT switch service switch room. If you're going to have a limbs of some description, you need hopefully datamite. 
uh, it, you need to have a, uh, a server and a, and a switch room controlling all that. Um, types of benches required, that goes without saying, no good having a plastic bench if you're using lots of solvent. HVAC, this is something that gets missed in a lot of occasions. Um, in when you're building a lab, if you've got air coming out of the lab, so you're actually sucking it out with the fume cupboards or what have you, you then have to replace that air with something. If you've got an asbestos hazard, you can't be sucking air from outside without filtration. So in some cases, you can actually have uh, a bag house working in reverse outside supplying the air to the to the mine site lab. That actually works quite well. And the bags do so little work, they almost last forever. So it's just another way of getting air, filtered air, back into the lab. Uh, safety cabinets, of course, if you've got chemicals stored, you need to have safety cabinets. They've got to be, the chemicals have to be separated. You need fume cupboard scrubbers. If you're not doing any kind of acid work or, or strong caustic work or anything like that, then you may not need fume cupboard. Or you may need a fume cupboard and no scrubber. Depends on what you're doing. Storing bulk chemicals. Often uh, people get to the stage where they've built the lab and then they go, well, we've got to order in uh, five 200 litre containers of HCL. Where are we going to put that? So sometimes a, uh, a container will do that job. Uh, crib rooms and toilets, often you, well, I have actually designed a lab and I said, oh, where's the crib rooms and toilets? Well, it wasn't on the scope of work, so you need to find out these things. You can also have, going back to hazards, you can also have sulphide, century mining Queensland, for example, they have SO2 monitoring throughout the lab because there's simply, uh, the, the, the pit is nearby and it actually, um, it actually burns. It actually burns. You can see smoke coming off it on a daily basis. So they need to keep monitoring all that sort of stuff. Uh, you still got small reagent storage. Um, you can't be storing organic materials with oxidants and oxidizers and stuff like that. You've got to consider fire extinguishers, hoses, and hazard zones. Um, these days, hazard zones are areas where you may have explosive gases in that area. So you need to have certain types of electrical switching and so on. So that may be a factor in, involved in your particular lab. Uh, do you get a specialist lab builder um, for the uh, building in the fit out? Often uh, builders that are called in don't understand what a laboratory is and can make some rather uh, comedic errors in the build. So fit out, of course, is always important because if you have the wrong person doing a fit out, you can end up with copper lines on your acetylene gas bottle and blow yourself to bits. So all of these things need to be considered. Okay, so you've got all those things sorted out. What, are, what about running the lab? Now you're going to need MSDSs. You need to have them within date, five years. Uh, do you get those off the internet? You can't find most of them on the internet. Or do you get a specialist supplier like uh, Chem Alert or somebody like that? Procedures need to be written. You need to have procedures. I think everybody, whenever they leave an area, probably takes procedures with them. It seems to happen pretty commonly. So um, procedures shouldn't be that difficult to find. You should be able to uh, find them from somewhere. Uh, you also get scope creep. Um, lab I'm going to shortly. Uh, Antimony wasn't on the scope of work. Now they're finding they've got to do antimony. So uh, that sort of happens. And also the scope can scope creep can include volumes as well. So you can start out with 300 samples a day and end up with 500 samples a day. So need to make an allowance to some degree in the lab for those sorts of things. Commissioning and training. Who's going to commission it and train it? Well, probably normally you employ a chemist or somebody like that, at least somebody with supervisory ability and get them to commission all the equipment and get it up and running. Training, of course, you can get by the ICP people, the XRF people, the AA people or whatever. Um, accreditation, we spoke about that before. And, of course, then there's data management, which is why we're here today. Um, it's often unconsidered and in many laboratories that I go to 
I think the errors are around 0.4%. So if you're entering 1,000 bits of data, you're going to probably enter them four of those wrongly on average. If you then have to take those 1,000 bits of data and enter them again into a geological or net balancing system, you're going to have the same additional errors. So can you live with those sorts of things? Um, can you also live with people having their own QC protocols? You know, they just uh, decide that something's okay based on their gut feeling, not on the data that's there in front of them. Or do you need to have some, some system like C-Class that locks that in place? Can you do QA, QC reports? Who wants to sit down for four hours doing a Q, set of QC reports, control charts for every standard you run in a month? Not me. Um, can you import data into, should be, into plant systems? Um, obviously, data mine, that's what they make their, their money on. They can put a system in place that carries the data from start to finish. Um, you don't have data entry issues. And of course, barcoding, is that going to help you with your, uh, with your um, sample management? Okay, then you go back to, the, you're actually building the lab. You're, uh, have you given the data sheets to the builder? If he has, if he's going to install some pipe work for an ICP, is he, is he using the correct size pipe work? Is he using the correct size, uh, correct type of tubing? Um, so all of these things need to be done. You need to get the, all the data sheets for the installation of the equipment for the builder, even if it's a um, specialist lab builder. Uh, gas piping we've touched on before with the acetylene. If it's done wrong, you either run out of something or you blow yourself up. So all that's got to be considered. HVAC, HVAC we touched on before as well. You need to have your HVAC balanced in the lab. If you don't have a balance, many mine sites I go to, they've got lovely fume cupboard there, a wall-mounted air conditioner on the other side, um, which is air conditioning the fume cupboard only. That's, that's what happens. Um, you need to get all these things balanced so there's the air intake for the fume cupboard so it doesn't pull the air conditioner air out of it. Power points need to be in the right places, fire rating on building, placement of equipment. Um, Placement equipment, if you leave it up to the builder, they're probably going to put it in the wrong spot. You need to mark out where everything's going to go. Their duct work for their connections is usually flexible enough to allow for something like that. And of course, final thing is you put all your doors in and you can't get a piece of equipment and the XRF won't fit through the door. So what do you do? Well, you pull out a window or you pull out a wall and you redo it. So you've got to make sure that each lab uh, main entry point is large enough to get an ICP, an X-ray, a fume cupboard, or whatever through it. So your lab's up and running. What happens? First thing that happens, you get told by geology or met people, you've got a bias in the data. So what do you do now? Well, first thing you do is keep an open mind. Just because somebody says it's so doesn't mean it's actually so. So what you've got to do is you go through all your procedures. Are they correct procedures? Are they being used correctly? Are the instruments, balances, dispensers, prepares all being calibrated? Uh, are the, do the certified reference materials show the same bias? Often a case, uh, you, you, the metallurgy says there's a, a bias, but the CRMs are not saying that. Um, has there been a change in the ore type? One mine site up north had uh, oxidised gold copper ore when they went through to sulphide ore and that caused a major problem with them doing their apparatus. Um, so that's, that can be a factor, a change in the ore type. Uh, do different shifts exhibit the same bias? So if you've got uh, a day shift, a night shift, and you get stratification of the results, so you get you know, one ship's coming up with your CRMs up here and the other ship's coming up there, then it's a systematic error on the part of one of those ships. Uh, so the other thing is, is equipment failing for some reason? Is there some issue with the equipment? And of course, calibration standards for the instruments relevant to AA and of course ICP, ICPMS, not necessarily for uh, XRF. So 
you need to keep an open mind and you need to go through each one of these things and determine whether they're actually whether they can get a tick or a cross next to them. So all I can say is if it seems a bit overwhelming, you need help with the project, then contact me through data mine. Thank you very much. Now, have you any questions about um, this presentation? How, sorry, um, how do you plan for future changes? <laughs> so just, just Ian, just I'll, I'll just um, uh, uh, say the question so that people on, on the recording. So, um, so how do you plan for the future, David? Sorry for. Uh, Okay, so question is, um, how do you plan for the future for you know bigger, small equipment? So, okay, um, it depends on your budget more than anything else. Um, I've recently done some uh, lab design work for somebody who I, I generally do a design that is big enough for the equipment there, um, but often they'll come back and say, "Can you make it smaller?" And, and the answer is obviously no. But in this case, I had uh, the opposite effect where um, somebody came back to me and said, can we make it bigger? Because we've been allocated a certain amount of space and um, we want to fill that space. And I said, oh yeah, you can make it as big as you want. So in that case, it, it's come down to budget is the answer to your question. If, if there's a budget there, um, yes, you always add extra building to the site because then you can always put in equipment. If you don't have extra building, you can't put the equipment in. You've got to build a building and the equipment. So it doesn't matter if there's a budget there. It doesn't matter if the lab's a bit too big, um, but it does matter if it's too small for future growth. Um, if you uh, you know allow for, obviously, a small increase in, in workload and the workload doubles, it's unlikely you're ever going to have enough space to be able to deal with that sort of situation. It's, uh, you know, you'd be building a new lab. Any other questions? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so, question from the floor was, how do you de deal with uh, delivery supply on time? Um, I don't get involved in that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just, I recommend certain instrumentation, certain equipment, and uh, the rest is up to them. One of the things I do include in any kind of, well, I do an Excel spreadsheet with the, the plan and then I have an equipment list and a list of consumables. And then any particular data like um, treatment plants for sewage and uh, you know, for the outfall from the lab and so on, I put on another spreadsheet. But um, it's very bad at the moment, as you're probably all aware. Um, for example, one of the recent uh, labs I did, the lead up time for a particular piece of equipment was 280 days, not as say one year. And because they say something like that, then you, you've got to wonder whether when you finally get to give them the order, whether it's still going to be 280 or maybe 350 or something. So it's a real problem. However, we have many suppliers of most of the gear. I mean, these days you can get three different XRFs, um, well, that I know of. Uh, there's two major ICP suppliers. There are um, many ring mill suppliers. Um, so there is a, there are alternatives um, if you do strike that sort of problem, but you need to be flexible in that. What do you want? Do you want the best equipment or do you want it here now? Um, because if you get second-rate second, second rate equipment, you might be looking for some new equipment in six months or 12 months. Do you have a question, David? Yeah, just saying that um, perhaps a condition after thought at the end of the project um, is a bit strange, but and you talk about scope creep, so I'm assuming you, you generally have a budget and it's a strict budget, so what, how do you deal with that scope creep? So, so yeah. So, question from the floor was, how do you deal with uh, scope scope 
oak so, creep so. in laboratory design. Does that summarise it? Yeah, it would be the, in, the, in the environment having a defined budget. Yeah, in the environment having a defined budget. Um, similar question to what I've got before. Um, Generally speaking, you can't. You, you, you would always put in enough equipment to do the work in the scope and then some. Um, for example, uh, if there's 200 acreages to do a day, I'd be putting in two fume cupboards. Um, if nothing else, you might need the other fume cupboard for your, um, your cyanide work or something like that. So you'd always be trying to cover that area, but it's not always possible. The um, lab I did in Cambodia was designed with 250 odd geology samples a day. They're getting 500 and then they're complaining about turnaround. I said, well, this is way outside the scope. And they're not, they're gonna have to put in another fume cover. They've already got two, they're gonna have to put in another fume cover and so on. So you, you try and cover it to an extent and I mean one crusher obviously can crush a lot of samples in a 24-hour period. Um, you'd, uh, you know, you'd probably be unlikely to need the secondary crusher. So you do have some built-in redundancy in terms of handling larger numbers of samples. Um, but scope creep is a real problem, especially for the uh, Intertex and the and the ALSs and the SGS guys because they set up their labs to do a certain thing. And if, if they're a mine site lab, um, you know, the boot arrangement or whatever, or contract lab, they set them up to do a certain thing. And often that thing becomes thing times two. And uh, trying to deal with that within the constraints of the contract can be very difficult. As I'm sure they can attest. Yeah, commercial labs get scope creep as well. I mean, uh, in the days of Pilbara Labs, um, we contracted with Telfer to give us, uh, I can't remember, 25,000 samples a month or something for fire assay and prep, and they're all two kilos. <laughs> and the average weight of them was seven and a half kilos. And you go back to the client and you say, well, you know, we can't do this for the price and we can't give you the turnaround. Um, what do you want to do? And I said, well, you've got to. Otherwise, we'll pull the work. So, you know, there's leverage on all sides. But um, at the end of the day, they had to put up with poorer turnaround uh, for their work. So... Yeah, scope creep comes in everywhere and it can be in all forms. It can be more samples, larger samples, wetter samples, um, harder samples, softer samples, you know, things that you didn't foresee in the original contract can be a real problem. Anybody else? Any more? Oh, well, great. Um, thanks, Ian. No worries. Okay. <laughs>